remember to subscribe and share. Ian Stenlake is one of Australia's favourite leading men. He starred in shows like Sea Patrol, Murder Call, Stingers and Dance Academy. On stage he's performed in shows, many shows, including Oklahoma, Guys and Dolls and Cabaret with Aussie songstress Tina Arena. He's currently touring Australia in the stage show Elvis, A Musical Revolution. And believe it or not, Ian Stenlake is my guest today. Ian, welcome. Welcome to Noel Anderson's 15 Minutes of Fame. Well, good morning, Noel. This is such a joy, such a pleasure to be here on your 15 Minute Fame. It's fantastic. Well, I tell you, I wasn't expecting you to be sitting in your car, but uh, but you tell me you're, <laughs> you're actually at IKEA doing a little yes. bit of um, renovating in the house, are we? Well, do you know what? I'm on. I'm currently on tour with Elvis, A Musical Revolution. So I'm down in Melbourne on tour. The place where we're staying, I broke a plate, so I want to replace the plate. <laughs> oh, okay. Hey, you know what? When I was thinking about you, the other day lots of memories come back about about you but i always remember your vibrant enthusiastic personality and and i was hoping that that when we got to chat that you had lost none of that so have you still <laughs> got it there in i reckon i've got lots of it i'm getting older so you know there's a little bit more jade in the color maybe but no, i'm i think i'm genuinely uh pretty similar to when we met years ago yeah look and i'm picking that vibe up from you hey one of the things i wanted to do with this um podcast was talk about leading men because you've spent ah. a lot of time on stage and in film and TV as a leading man. And I'm just wondering, before I start asking you some questions about things you've done, is there any leading men that inspired you, you know, to be an actor? Or is there, is there someone that you looked up to as a youngster growing up in gorgeous Bris Vegas? <laughs> you know, it, it's a great question. My journey with acting sort of came from almost like a blank slate growing Growing up, I didn't have any people that I looked up to, per se. It was really a chance meeting on, uh, you know, a backpacking trip throughout Europe with the cast of a big Hollywood film called uh, The Godfather Part 3 and ending up on the set of that show and working for 10 days as an extra. Long story short, the way that I got onto that set was through a true leading man, a guy called Frank D'Ambrosio, who played, uh, apart from playing Al Pacino's son in The Godfather Part 3, he went on to be the longest running phantom of the opera in San oh, Francisco. Wow. I think he did something like three and a half thousand performances. So I'm not sure if he still holds the record, but certainly was, you know, the longest running phantom ever for a while. Probably if exhausted still is. even and... if he's done three and a half thousand performances of phantom. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that sounds to me like a hard gig, as beautiful as the show is. Yeah, but he sat in it and just, it, this was in San Francisco and he, and he stayed with that show for several years, obviously. And and look, he, he was sort of the catalyst for me to become an actor. He is truly a leading man that I would look up to, um, not one that many people have heard of, certainly in Australia. But, you know, obviously Godfather fans would know who I'm talking about because he played the opera singing son uh, of the Godfather himself. So uh, Anthony Corleone, I think his name was. When you were growing up in, in Brisbane, did you do any training in Brisbane? or I mean, I know you went to NIDA because we were there at, at the same time at one point. I grew up in uh, the church, basically, because my father's a minister. And so... Musically, I had a lot of input and a lot of um, people around me. Like within a church, I was in choirs and my family were quite musical. I learned the piano a bit. I did have a couple of singing lessons, but nothing ever followed through. And I used to be sort of this guy that you'd call upon if you're in an emergency. You know, the, the church might be putting on a play or something and someone gets sick two days before they open. I'll get in. He'll do that. But I was sort of like this, uh, you know, periphery, always thinking it's what I'd love to do, but never having the courage to actually take those steps and so after my the, the situation in Rome the, on um, The Godfather Part 3 when I came back to Brisbane I contacted my grade 12 English teacher Lisa Hickey and I said I remember that you were in a show at the Lyric Theatre up there a pro-am show called I think it was called uh, oh, Sure Woodstock it was done at the Performing Arts Centre in Brisbane it was a yeah. huge thing up in Brisbane massive I, I was there at the time yeah yeah and I remember you know this English teacher teacher telling me the story about a show she did where there were professionals in it, but also a lot of amateurs. So I came home from this backpacking trip, you know, and dropped out of commerce law 
and said, I'm going to become an actor, much to my parents' delight. I rang Lisa and said, are they doing any more of those shows? And she said, Ian, they're auditioning next week. And so I've come home from that trip, contacted Lisa. I go to an audition a week later and I'm doing a show in Brisbane, you know, two weeks after I get home after this trip. So it was just the timing of everything and the snowball effect just seemed to work. And I was basically then learning from people around me. You know, that's that will bring us, I'm sure, to our conversation of when you and I I first crossed paths, but I did Fan Toad of the Opera, which was a spoof, obviously, of Phantom of the Opera at the Lyric Theatre. And then, and that, that sort of, you know, the people I met, I kind of plugged into the vibrant amateur scene of uh, Brisbane City and did amateur work for a year and then got picked up by Grin and Tonic Theatre Troupe, which is a professional company, um, and started working professional and then thought uh, professionally and then thought, you know what, I need to learn about what I'm doing here. <laughs> And that's when I uh, got really serious and then applied for NIDA. Because the last time I remember having a, a real conversation with you, I had been on a retreat at NIDA for a writing retreat and I'd had a yes. very rough time. And you you yep. came over and they, they were having a big a big day where everybody was called into NIDA. The whole school was there. You were there. I was there. I was complaining about my week at this retreat. And you said some yeah. very um, nice things, which I can't remember, probably like ignore the buggers or something like that like that i can't remember <laughs> what you said but you gave me a bit of advice like just move on from it that would have been uh 1996 could that be correct yeah so that was my final year of nida yep uh okay i thought you might have been in third year that that year as well That's... when you left nida i thought your first big role i could remember you doing was sea patrol but it wasn't uh, so... it, it was stingers wasn't it yes it was the other way That's around right yeah sorry i didn't realize that but it was stingers that was in 2007, is that correct? Oh, no, 10 years earlier. So 1997. So 2007 yeah, yeah, maybe... must have been Sea Patrol. Yes, indeed. That's okay, exactly right. right. So, um, yeah, I graduated in 96 and then I, I nearly got a job on uh, Summer Bay. What's, what am I talking about? Home and Away. Home and um, away. Literally, I graduated, say, let's say, on a Thursday. I went to Mulliner's Casting on Friday and I was shortlisted down to the final two. And I would have started work like a week later, but it went to Richard Greaves so I was then out in the open and I literally did 13 episodes of Children's Hospital for the ABC in Sydney and so those 13 weeks of television were really where I you know I went from a, a NIDA graduate with a lot of theatre experience into crossing over into the t TV world and and just learnt a lot on that show and met some great people and, and then I was down in Melbourne a, a year later I, I guess towards the end of 97 and into 98 and ended up getting on to Stingers which was you know five series of 22 episodes um, and took about four years to shoot those those five ep uh, series. Here's a question for you. It's, a very, it's kind of a bit of an odd question. So you did Stingers, then you did Sea Patrol, and the very first episode of Sea Patrol was called Welcome Aboard. And as I said before, <laughs> it, was, um, it was in 2007. What do you yeah. remember about that very first day shooting that episode, Welcome Aboard? Sea Patrol was an incredible opportunity and also a very, very unique television series in so much that it was 13 episodes long and it was shot like a film. So we didn't shoot sequentially. I literally had to read 13 episodes, be ready from week one to the end of the shoot to be ready to play any scene from any one of those 13 episodes. So when I think back to Welcome Aboard, I think my earliest memories were, were day one when I met the rest of the cast and, and people would were literally coming down the hill and I'd go, oh, wow, there's Lisa McKee. June, she's in the show. And I had no idea who was in the show with me. And then, you know, oh, Jeremy Lindsay Taylor, we did, we met on Stingers. And, and then, oh, here comes Johnny Batch, another Queenslander. Um, just, just that is the excitement of a brand new show and, and seeing the, the, the cast that you know are going to become your family very quickly. And uh, it was such a great time and such a beautiful company. The producers, Hal and Di McElroy, from them down through the entire cast and crew was just, just a fantastic time. Many years ago, I did three months on patrol boat, um, and which was shot on uh, in the pit water. And wow. it, and it, let me tell you, it was wow. um, it, it was a big ask to shoot something in on a ship. It was shot in Sydney Harbour, wasn't it? Is it around the harbour? Well, you know, I'm going to learn a lot now. We did the first series. We did three weeks on the harbour. Uh, two of the navy um, bases, uh, I think it was Penguin and uh, maybe Waterhen. And after that, the entire series was shot in Queensland. So Cairns base was where we did the alongside stuff, and then.
then off uh, Mission Beach, we would do about eight weeks on the actual patrol boat. So most of Sea Patrol, except for the three weeks in the first series, the rest of it was shot in Cairns, uh, Mission Beach, and uh, on the Gold Coast. I am really surprised by that. What I was thinking about that, you know, they're very long days. They're very hard days. If you've ever done a show that is shot on water or in a ship of any kind, some of those days, you know, you're up at four in the morning to be at the studio, yeah. to get to the boat, to shoot the scenes. And then by the time you're, you're kind of back in the studio again, it can be quite often eight o'clock at night, you know, so they, they yes. can be huge days. They were, and, you know, certainly working at sea and on alongside and on board the, you know, well, the HMAS Hammersley, as we called it, but this was an actual, an actual Navy ship with a real crew. Um, and that crew, you know, they became our extras and also were, were constantly monitoring our work and making sure we were being authentic. And there was a, a brilliant collaboration between, you know, the Australian TV world and the um, the armed forces. So it was really, really special. I've got to just say to you, though, that if you worked on patrol boat, you would have worked, well, at some point, Robert Colby was in and around that series. Yeah, and then 30 years later, his son, Conrad, was in Sea Patrol. So oh, there was a beautiful God. synchronicity there. Yeah. I mean, oh, amazing that, to think that, you know, 30 fantastic. years later, you've got this huge, just hulking, handsome young actor. And of course, he's going, oh, well, my dad was in the original patrol boat. So it was uh, a, a nice sort of uh, continuity there. Which reminds me, you've just jogged my memory. I've seen, I've been stalking you a little bit on social media, as, as as I always do before I chat to somebody. You've got a little girl who I think is only she's Before. fairly young. Would you want her to be an actress? In would uh, is that something you'd like her to do? Look, uh, I mean, I found acting, or uh, as I often say, acting found me. Um, it was not something that was family oriented, and you sort of as you you work and grow in this uh, in this community, you realise that a lot of people that get into it sort of get into it because they know it's a real thing they know it's something you know it's tangible because they've got family or you know people they know that are in it who have, who, who introduced them to it so scarlet is going to be very you know she's going to know that there is an opportunity for that sort of career i'm not going to say yes or no she can find her own way she's currently dancing up a storm in her ballet classes and she loves to sing so let's just see what happens oh look at that sounding like she's a she's the next um i don't know she might be the next kylie for all we know ian <laughs> <laughs> it could be she could be <laughs> now you've you've not only with, with um doing TV and film and 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 all of that you've also done a lot of theater and a lot of a lot of musicals I'm wondering what is your favorite musical out of all the musicals you've done what's your favorite role you know it's so hard because I kind of invest every time I get a role it's just it's everything to me for that you know for, while I'm doing it and to pick a favorite is almost like picking a, a favorite child if you know what I mean but uh, yeah. look I've got to admit I Cabaret, playing Clifford Bradshaw and Cabaret as my first professional, big professional musical was extraordinary because it was a Sam Mendes production and, you know, I knew I was part of something special and, and really enjoyed the, the vigorous kind of, uh, you know, it, it challenged me emotionally and uh, and professionally. And you're opposite, um, you're opposite Tina Arena as well. Um, so that must have correct, been yes. that must have been exciting. It was super exciting. I mean, to to play opposite her and then, and just to be on stage and hear her sing and, and be that close to her, you know, was was uh, you know, really, really incredible, really special. And then years later, I was playing Sky Masterson in Guys and Dolls, and that was fun. And Curly in Oklahoma. These are kind of classics. Um, and uh, and then since then, I've had some really nice, like, brand new productions that some have gone on, some haven't. But it's always it's been a, an amazing journey to create roles as well. And I mean, even in this latest one, Elvis: A Musical Revolution, it's never been played. You know, it's a, it's a, a world premiere for a professional production, and and so we've created these roles and and this is a musical where for the first time I'm not really singing in it certainly I have no solos and it's not really a singing role and so here I am all these years later getting stretched uh, you know it's a real character role and I'm really finding that thrilling and in Elvis the musical you're playing Colonel Parker which of course was yeah. Elvis's um, manager played by Tam Tom Hanks in the recent film were you tempted to look at what Hanks Tom Hanks did and if you didn't look at what Tom Hanks did how did how did you approach that character. Yeah, so, I mean, we're so lucky as actors today in that, you know, the, the internet is such a valuable resource for uh, study or for, for research. And, uh, you know, the old days, you'd be looking up books and trying to work out what year the show set, what was, what was you know, what, what's the country like in that year and who is this person and Encyclopedia Britannica or something. But now there's, it's such a rich, a rich uh, mine of information. And so I had never heard of Colonel Parker when, when the casting brief came through. And I kind of 
kind of, first of all, read the brief and thought, oh, okay, sounds interesting. And then, you know, then I went, oh, Tom Hanks played this role in the movie, which I hadn't seen. And I was thinking, all right, well, if Tom Hanks is the last person to play this role, that's that's pretty big shoes to, to try and fill. And so I deliberately did not watch the movie. Um, and I've done that pretty much with every show I've ever done. I have gone into audition process and usually rehearsal process uh, with no outside influence because I, I want to take, I want it to be my take on it completely. And so when I started diving into the life of Colonel Tom Parker, I was blown away by the fact that one, I'd never heard of him. And two, he's just an extraordinary character. And so I just, you know, based my characterization on bits of physical uh, evidence I could find of him, whether that was, I mean, there's not much around of him. He was a very private person. There's only one real soundbite of him pre-19, you know, pre-Elvis's death. And um, that was in 1956, but it's a good 20 minutes. And, you know, I, I based my entire accent on that. And that accent, I can tell you, is completely different to Tom Hanks. That's for sure. When you play somebody that's real, I was thinking this as you were talking about cabaret as well. The original stories was, uh, were called the Berlin Stories, and that was written yes. by Christopher Isherwood. And then that was adapted into a play called I Am A Camera. Then that was adapted yep. into cabaret. But at the very um, essence of those stories, in whatever form they're in, the lead character who you played in the musical was essentially Christopher Isherwood. Do, do you yes. feel when you're playing somebody that's real, um, or you know, carry or some characters that are based on someone that's real? Do you feel you have a responsibility to respect those characters, or do you want your creativity to to flow free and reinterpret those characters? Well, yeah, that's a really uh, fascinating question. I guess I, my first instinct is to respect that character, but I also think that you know i have to find myself in that character too so i don't don't disallow that freedom that creative freedom for aspects of myself to flow through as well but certainly i think my major it is for me it is about respecting that character and i feel really you know there's a really uh it's not a i don't feel responsible in terms of oh, i've got a real responsibility a heavy kind of responsibility to get this right or anything i feel privileged i feel and you know and i let that imagination go and i really feel i really want to be them and i want them to flow through me and then that character is part of a story that we're telling so I want that characterization to flow through me and help everyone that I'm working with tell the story that we want to tell as authentically and you know intelligently that we can um, and so a character like Colonel Parker I just you know I look I look deep into his life as deeply as I could in terms of garnering what people say about him and at the end of the day you know that you're not going to get everything right but you've just got to give it your best shot and it's interesting you bring up Cabaret because you know that was like 2004 or something and the internet wasn't really pumping back then so I was just reading books and, and going to libraries to find out about a Christopher Isherwood and uh, and even took myself to Berlin to get a real sense of where he was in, in the real world at that time. Well, I hope you stayed out of some of those nightclubs in Berlin, which are supposed to be pretty wild, In Do you have any um, wild <laughs> Berlin stories you can share right now? <laughs> well, let's, let's just say I got out of them uh, before I got into any trouble, put it that oh, way. Oh, that, that, that sounds pretty good. Hey, one of the things you've done like as a, as a regular every year, and, and because um, this is this is kind of my last podcast for the year and it's Christmas time, um, you've done um, yes. carols uh, by candlelight regularly. Is that something you're doing again this year? It's something I'd love to do it this year. So they're aware that I'm in Melbourne. The, the Elvis cast is being considered as we speak, um, but they've got a lot of, uh, there's a lot of kind of uh, musicals and, and a lot of, I, I wouldn't say competition, but there's a lot of choice this year for the carols producers to choose from i'm available as a member of the elvis cast i'm available as a solo artist and uh only time will tell that we, we might know in the next few days but yeah i'd love to do it again it, it, i had you know sitting in uh, paddington in brisbane many many years ago on a christmas eve i saw david bowie and bing crosby sing peace on earth little drummer boy on rage you know at two in the morning or something i had a dream back then that if my acting career was going well that one day I would sing that song at the, the Melbourne Meyer, you know, Music Bowl Christmas Carols. And, you know, to my absolute delight, I got to sing it with Michael Cormick oh, uh, many, many years later. And it was a very satisfying feeling to think, well, I've, I think I vision boarded that. Uh, it was certainly a dream come true to do it. And I think I've done it maybe four or five times I've, I've performed at the Christmas Carols. And they certainly are a highlight. Something that, because I'm not based in Melbourne anymore, um, it doesn't happen for me as, as much. Because you mentioned earlier on that you grew up uh, with a Christian upbringing. When you're 
doing something like Carols by Candlelight, and, and some of those songs do have that uh, sensibility to them, does your Christianity come back to you or did it never leave you or, yeah, does it reinforce it for you? Christmas is, you know, it is a special time. It's sort of based in Christianity. Um, and so, you you know, it's a bit of a conflicting time I'm finding it these days because, you know, is it is it Christmas holidays or is it happy holidays? And I think for me, you know, it reminds me that I had a very Christian upbringing, you know, surrounded by family, um, certainly my parents who are still very devout Christians to this day. It reminded me of that upbringing. Uh, it reminded me of the positive aspects of Christianity. I think I think the positive things to come out of Christianity are how it can help people in times of need. It can promote healthy relationships. And and so I think that's what it is for me. And, and so I don't mind singing Christian songs or, or things that, you know, that have that sort of influence in them, knowing that it's everyone has their own choice and and it's, it's a nice time of the year just to, to be surrounded by people that you love and that you want to be close to. Which I think probably is bringing us to the end of our um, our podcast on that, Ian. One of the things I, I will ask you before you go, and I don't know if I've asked I did, if I asked this earlier, I don't think I did, but is there a role left that you'd love to play? Something, you know, that you could say, that someone could write on your gravestone at the end, you know, you could, you could write something like, at least I got to do this role etched into your grave. <laughs> Stone. What would that role be? <laughs> no, you know, uh, you know, at a certain point there, I I had to let go of Romeo. I just thought I'm not going to get a chance to play him anymore. Uh, you know, I'm heading I'm heading towards King Lear, but I don't want to get there too soon. Like you know, Kenneth Branagh might have got there a bit too soon. Let's just see. Look, it's a wonderful question. Les Mis was sort of always on my target list as a Javert or perhaps a Jean Valjean, and I kind of feel like that by the time I got to the age where I thought. I'd be in the running to play it. I feel like they're now casting it a lot younger, so I yeah. might have missed that boat as well. And so, do you know what? I ha- I'm going to use that question to motivate me. Very recently, a fantastic director, uh, Alistair Smith, um, who who directed me in in Elvis, said to me, "You know, what do you want to do?" So I think I'm going to, you know, go away and find out what that role is, and maybe get a chance to do it. Well, when you find out what it is, you can come back on 15 minutes of fame again. You can t- tell me about it. Hey, um, <laughs> did you? you want to plug Elvis? Do you want to give it a plug before you go? Yeah, I will. You know what? Elvis, uh, Musical Revolution, uh, we finished in, in Melbourne on the, the last day of the year. I think it's about one o'clock on New Year's Eve. We've got our last show in Melbourne. And then we're off to Sydney for a little re- return season uh, throughout February. And then then we go to Adelaide in April and then across to Perth for sort of May, June, and then to the Gold Coast. So we're not quite getting to Brisbane, but we'll be at the Home of the Arts or Hotter on the Gold Coast throughout July. Well, Ian, there's only, there's only two things left for me to say. First one is Merry Christmas and hope you Thank have a, you. Good, a good Christmas and a good year. And the very Thank last you. one, which I know you're just waiting for me to say, is Ian Stenlake, this has been your 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> Thank you, Noel. I love you. That's it. We've done it. I think you got away a bit scot-free there because, you know, you gave me literally, I think, my third ever role. I did yeah, Fan Toad yeah. of the Opera. I did Angry Housewives. And then I think Dames at Sea. Yeah, well, we did Dames at Sea in P.S. In the... uh, your Cat is Dead. And, and strangely enough, Ian, I went back and looked at some of the reviews we got for P.S. Your Cat is Dead and we cleaned yeah. up. Those reviews, we were, those reviews were incredible. Even I was the... surprised reading them. So um, I'm really happy yeah, you used this little bit as a tag because Noel you were literally instrumental in my journey as an actor and I want to thank you for that publicly Fantastic. I'm uh, you know forever indebted to you well look at us we're both still doing something in entertainment as years go on don't know why I'm still doing things I've got no idea I have no answer for that but I guess <laughs> I guess we're both still doing it because we love it and I think that's yes that's the reason why If you enjoyed this podcast, Noel Anderson's 15 Minutes of Fame, remember to subscribe and share.